So what we are going to talk today is on the Scala Web HMIs. And the idea is to understand, you know, different kind of vulnerabilities that persist in those kind of web uh, interfaces that are used by uh, Scala devices. So let's get it started. So a little bit background on mine. Uh, I'm actually uh, architecting the Cloud Threat Labs for a cloud security firm called well, Elastica. We're based out of San Jose. And uh, just I wrote a book on targeted cyber attacks. If you get a chance, just try to take a look at it. And just uh, normal scenarios. So before going to discuss the research in this talk, I just want to lay a disclaimer. Whatever the vulnerabilities or the issues that we're going to discuss uh, are solely based on my research. It does not relate to my previous or present employers. And all the vulnerabilities that we are going to you know, take a look at have been reported to ICS cert in this scenario. And they are in the process of patching it. A couple of the vulnerabilities have already been patched. So Siemens or, and other vendors are actually working to you know, address the issue. So let me get into the brief idea of why SCADA is becoming a problem because of like a big critical infrastructure or any several things because this is getting on the edge right at this point of time. Attackers are targeting SCADA infrastructure devices and all along try to get control of the infrastructure. And then from there onwards you can have a diversified impact uh, on the target. So just to pick up some of what media is talking about in here, you know, SCADA system face diverse software attack threats and several other issues. But the end point is this is a problem. And we need to take a look into it as a you know, community, you know, hunt for vulnerabilities, report to the ICSRT, and you know, just make it secure. But later down the lane, during the course of this presentation, you will realize that security design is completely broken for this. So we'll take a look into it. So before uh, moving further, let's have an idea of you know, the you know, vulnerabilities of SCADA that are being existed in the um, last few years and how the trend is going on. I took this snapshot from the SCADA hacker, a very good website, go along, I and mean, there's a lot of interesting resources on it. And so they actually took this statistics from the OSVDB, and then they get an idea that you know, how the trend is moving forward. So until now, 2015, you'll see 98 vulnerabilities have been released. And if you look at from the last couple of years, the trend is increasing. It's exponential. So it means that the more you get a visibility in here, the more you're prone to attacks in this scenario. And that is what's happening with the SCADA infrastructure. Another uh, brief look on the way the SCADA vulnerabilities from the ICS cert advisories. So this one is released by Fortinet uh, a few days, uh, like just like a few weeks back. So if you get an uh, idea, you will. Uh, come to know that different kind of, they have put up like a granular analysis, like different kind of vulnerabilities that exist in SCADA devices here. And so it goes from, you know, buffer overflows, directory travel, uh, man in the middle, DLL hijacking, and different kind of things. But if, even if you look at this scenario, vulnerabilities like remote file inclusions, local file inclusions, you know, authentication bypasses in those scenarios, uh, still is a wide variety of, uh, you know, vulnerabilities out there. We'll take a look into it. Now, Again, it's a big problem because if you look at the crimeware as a service where, you know, attackers in the underground market, you know, basically compromises the SCADA infrastructure and sell the control to the other buyers for just making money. And that actually is a one interesting point is that because the security is not up to that mark uh, with the SCADA security, so it becomes very easy for them to go ahead, you know, just sell the access, whatever, for, you know, manufacturing plant, dosing pumps, and, and things like that. But this is a big problem these days, and as a community, as I mentioned earlier, we have to come from and you know find issues, report, and help them to patch things. So take a look at it, the simple SCADA model. I mean, sometimes I have a couple of discussions with pretty good researchers and other no audience. Sometimes they think like HMI is not actually a part of SCADA, but if a whole uh, model, if you look at. So this is an HMI is a one component of it. You have a PLC, programmable logical controllers. You have drivers that are driving the and the SCADA devices. In this picture, I've basically taken a simple uh, scenario for, you know, you have HMI component, PLC, then you have an interface through drivers, and then it goes from the endpoint where the actual manufacturing plant or various devices that are put in works. So if you look in this particular model, you see that HMI is the front end. And from there onwards, you, know, you get a lot of statistics about the uh, different components of SCADA. And you can perform operations, you can look into statistics, you can go ahead and execute commands that will be flown through PLC to drivers and then at the endpoint motor. So target is looking into the HMI this point on. So basically, and a web HMI is a human machine interface through a web. Could be a web server embedded in a firmware, 
and uh, kind of other application, desktop applications, but in this particular talk we are targeting the web. An interesting point is that HMI provides, a, a, as I mentioned, uh, a visual representation of what is going inside the complete SCADA environment and uh, how the data is, uh, you know, taken from the panel and then how it is taken from the various uh, devices that are running at the back end. So in a simple way, it's a centralized control center managed through web, which means that if you control the web, uh, the front component of it, you can do much more with it. And we'll take a look within a scenario. So this is basically a web HMI. You can consider any web application, any embedded web server in a firmware which is exposed on the internet or maybe not properly secure and things like that. But will our motive in this particular talk, talk is to go into the uh, design and the security uh, of that web HMI, how they have actually designed, why they are not following the secure design principles and what could be the impacts. So, in this particular talk, I mean, you can talk, say that most of these devices are not deployed with SSL, which is fine. They are, you know, basically configured in a wrong manner because not securely configured. Uh, with, they are having a default username and password, or even if they configure the password, password is weak. You know, have self-signed certificates, no concept of declarative security, which actually means that if the web server tries to send some sort of headers, the embedded web server have no capability this point of time to send some sort of address back to the browser and from there onwards the browser can act accordingly for example X-Frame options content security so there is no concept of that at this point of time. But we are not going into these issues in this talk but what we are going to talk about is how the design has been done. So what we are going to hunt in this, so any embedded firmware primarily web servers, Java clients, flash clients, web technology used by HMS, anything that is exposed through web or you know, thin or thick client is a uh, target in this talk. So we are basically in this particular talk is going to target the front end. Any web based software that is used to control HMI, any software that is used to support HMI, any web component providing interface to the scatter device. So that's the target here. So what vendors we are going to look into from security vulnerability point of view. So, so there are plethora of vendors out there, but I chose and for this talk is Rockwell Automation, Allen Bradley Devices, Schneider Electric, Prisma, Mox, Zakako, Siemens, and there are a whole lot of vulnerabilities out there which I cannot discuss in this talk because of time constraint. But overall scenario, there are a lot of vulnerabilities out there. And we'll take a look and you might, uh, you know, think it is a fun, but it is actually a fun. When you look at the vulnerabilities, there are so ridiculous vulnerabilities out there. Now we are going to target for the next couple of minutes on the BMX uh, family of uh, devices which are being provided by the Schneider Electric. It's basically an HMI uh, active web services as a part of the web server embedded in the firmware. It provides real-time communication with the Ethernet, TCP, IP, what have been used for that end device. It has a capacity to host dynamic user-defined web pages to provide a lot of information what's going on. As a one target, let's talk about some vulnerabilities. So while I was doing research on it, so hard-coded vulnerability, uh, hard-coded password actually for the FTP account and they're one of the JAR file. We have a multiple CSERF vulnerabilities, remote file inclusion, local file inclusion, insecure authentication design. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this particular device, I want to lay more stress on the RFI, which I'll be demoing. Hopefully, the DEF CON um, network will work. Otherwise, we have our video. But let's just go into a bit of analysis. So let's say you go ahead, and I have not masked uh, uh, URL in this case, but if you go ahead and uh, you find this device and you open it in your browser, you will be presented with a Java. Basically, you need to install a Java applet for that. So you will be served like this. You say you want to install it because in order to access all the HMI functionalities, you have to access this uh, Java template and then you have to install it accordingly. So when you install it, you come up with, you know, when you download this Java applet, you try to look into the source code, you know, where the Java applet has been placed, how you can access it and things like that. So the whole, uh, just uh, this slide is going to tell you that where the Java applet is placed for that particular uh, web HMI and how you can access it. Basically simply looking into the source code of the web browser. Now when you do the source code analysis, 
Uh, I'm just presenting a, a figure here. So if you do the source code analysis of the jar file, you will get an idea that there is a one hard-coded password in it, and which is actually, uh, you can see, uh, factory cast at Schneider, and then you have a uh, FTP login assist dialog. So you're basically looking into the decompilation of a jar file, performing source code analysis, and this is hard-coded. And you can use it to actually access the FTP account on the uh, server. Moving forward, so a little bit doing a bit more of source code analysis, you get an idea all the config paths are uh, basically hard coded. So you can pick the path, put it in a URL, and if you are authenticated, you can even access it, or in certain cases, you can even bypass that too. Moving forward, so cross site request forgery vulnerabilities, no tokens are specified. So there is a complete URL, which is uh, simply HTTP get URL. You have these parameters. You simply force the user to click on the link and you can change the password. You can control the editor password and things like that. It's, it's all open in that scenario. And this one is one of the my interesting one. So they have a vulnerability in the scenario. It's an unauthenticated uh, remote file inclusion. So there is a one URL when you go search for URLs on that web HMI, you get to the one specific URL which they don't validating the input you are supplying. So it is I basically framing the content. So in this case, I have shown that on this particular device, you can include a remote file. And, uh, and I will be uh, demoing uh, uh, just a bit in seconds. S similarly, all these vulnerabilities are also present in the factory cost uh, devices. This is, might be by Tally Mechanic, and I think Schneider Electric and Tally Mechanic are you know, collaboratively releasing these devices. But if you go ahead, you know, like uh, pre previous devices, some old school devices, or even some of the devices that are being, uh, you know, released these days, the same vulnerabilities apply to factory cast. So I want to demo here the remote file inclusion vulnerability. Hope the network works. It was working just five minutes back. So. <laughs> so. Well, it happens at DEF CON all the time, but I have a backup. <laughs> It was a very interesting demo to actually show that how you can even download as use malware in an encoded format to the device. But if you get a chance later on, and I can show you where the network is working. But so this was the demo. So let's uh, take a demo look from the video point of view. So, so in this video, you will see that we are highlighting a remote file inclusion vulnerability in Schneider Electric BMX P34 CPUs, uh, basically the web HMI. The video might not tell you the exact that how you can download even a Zeus kind of thing in an encoded format, but it can give you an idea where is the vulnerability and what you can do with it. So we just try to, you know, you are, as a, you know, researcher, you try to look at what's going on in and out of the system. And you can see that even if you try to access some resource, it is basically restricted. So you need to provide a basic, so they have actually a basic authentication here. But we have. Sh this is the case we want to show. We want actually want to look at it. So I closed it. So now you see that the vulnerability is present in one of the setup index.html file where they are not actually validating what kind of content is being passed through it. So you can easily load any third party website directly into it. So in this case we just uploaded the black hat one. So I can explain that how this can be used in targeted attacks. The similar case you can go for, uh, you know, find a host or some sort of malware on the third party domain, you know, Zeus or any other variant of it. You basically encode the URL or you can use a URL shortener 
you can simply pass it through it and force the user to click it, basically any SCADA administrator or the guy. And in that way, you are able to download the malware on the end user system. And it's very, interestingly, you can also pass an exploit code through HTML file. So whenever it's got framed, the exploit code will execute in the browser and then you can get compromised directly, basically simply through a RFI in this case. The next uh, device I'm going to target here is the Mox IO logic, just from the authentication point of view. It's just a simple discussion. So basically, they don't provide any built in support for HTTPS in this. If you look at how the password is being hashed, it's basically the MD5, and there is no salt provided for it. So, which makes it pretty much vulnerable to the replay attacks. And even you can crack it within a speck of time. So, so whatever the vulnerabilities I'm discussing in this, uh, we have tested on a various uh, variation uh, versions uh, along uh, different devices, and these are basically tested on the uh, real uh, devices on the internet. So once you, so this is basically in, in self is a, like in a bad design where you pass your credential in the HTTP get because it's get cached everywhere, and then it becomes easy for the attackers when they get access to that any proxy device or maybe on the web server, everything's gonna get cached. So that's actually a bad security design. But in this case, we did a test for a real time device, maybe. So in this case, if you look, you will be uh, presented with this web login prompt, the remote IO server. You provide a password, and that kind of uh, HTTP request is issued. So you can see easily that there's MD5 hashes passed. And uh, in this particular case, so we actually moved forward and uh, just open a, some uh, normal website on the internet. And then you can see here that when we passed the MD5 hash, it was easily crackable. And uh, once you get an access to the password, uh, you can go ahead and access the complete Moxa logic. So the problem is that no salt passed in HTTP get, you know, one level to man in the middle, and things like that. But this is a big problem with the, from the authentication point of view in several web HMIs. They are not up to the mark. Now on the next target is our Siemens Semantic HMI web. I personally like the vulnerability that exists in this uh, web HMI. The reason is that because this HMI provides an explorer interface. So when you click the explorer interface, you will be presented with a directory listing of all the hard drives that are connected to it and any directories that are present on the server. In that scenario, if you move forward, just a case, so I want to highlight what vulnerability uh, present in it. It's like cross-site file uploading. So it's possible to actually upload a file by sending a crafted link to a target. Once he clicks the link, the file will be uploaded to the USB device that is connected to the, um, this uh, web HMI or even any Explorer interface on it. But again, CSER vulnerabilities are there. You can you know, execute any command or force the user to perform any actions which you are not authorized to do. In just particular, this snapshot, you get an idea that uh, when you are uh, uploading a file, snow tokens are specified, which is very bad design practice, and, uh, but this exists. So this is actually a web HMI for the Siemens Semantic HMI web, so I have actually shown an explorer interface. So you can get an idea, we are into the root directory of that uh, web HMI for this particular one. And there is another small snapshot is presented there that once we uploaded the file, you can access the file directly from there. And if you look at this particular screenshot, you get an idea that we use in a simple XML HTTP request uh, to trigger the cross-origin, um, not a cross-origin, actually just trigger the cross-site request, and then from there onwards we can upload any file directly to it. And then actually once you access it, you get a control of it, you can process files, you get a lot of data out of it. Maybe you can also upload a malware through the USB directly. If you remember in 2000, I think 2009, the Struxnet, where they simply upload a malware on the USB, but in this particular case, you can route it through the web and just force the user to click on a link, file will be uploaded directly to the uh, USB, and once they disconnect it, it can be taken care of that. And that is one case, but you can also upload files on the web panel and things like that. So another, so you have another cross-site request for three vulnerability, you can delete any files by again forcing the user to go ahead with it. No tokens, problem, you can keep on deleting files, log files and other interesting things. Now let's just take a look at this uh, vulnerability. So 
So actually, if, I'm rem if I remember correctly, the Siemens uh, is actually in the process of patching this one. The builder might have already patched, but you can try. So now in this case, you, we go to the file browser. You can see that there's a www root temp directory, storage card, storage card 2, and so now this is our target. We want to upload a file here. I've just created a custom demo, so just for the sake of showing what is ex exactly happening at the back end. So we click the button, but you can basically send a link. Once it has been clicked by the user, the active session is there, so automatically cookies will be taken care of, and then the request will be issued. So this is a cross file, site file upload vulnerability. Expired with just uh, uploading a test file. If you see, we don't have any test file at this point of time. So there's no file uploaded right now. And let's trigger the export code. Just try to show that how the request has been issued through the HTTP fox. And this all, uh, the URL can be sent all in an automated manner. So let's say we clicked it. The request has been issued. Ah, so the request has been accepted by the web server. And so this is a file we uploaded, a simple text file in this case. Now if you go back and we refresh the page, and there you go, we get a test2.txt file there. So idea is that you can upload any file, executable, or other cases, as I mentioned earlier, and from there onwards you can even access the file through that URL. So it's just like routing or compromising the end systems through web. And all these vulnerabilities play a significant role in it. And all these vulnerabilities, as I mentioned, tested against the real environment. So moving next, we're gonna target like Caco Solar device in this scenario. I'm not sure you're interested, but these are interesting vulnerabilities to understand what kind of design they are following. In this Caco Solar device, they have a, again, hard-coded administrator password. And these devices are heavily used for HMI visualization of uh, you know, solar plants, and we'll just take a look into it. Once you open a, you know, uh, this HMI interface through a web, you will be served with this XP Java template. They call it, but just the name. So you have to install a Java or you have to download a JAR file to it. And in the, another snapshot, uh, you can see that there is a links to where the JAR file is placed. So we follow the same tactics and uh, we perform this source code analysis and then from there onwards we get an idea. It's just an old system for the vulnerability demonstration. So if you take a look uh, in that, so you get a uh, username and password as uh, Kaki2 and then something Kako2008 and all that. Now interesting part is that you, this password will give you a direct access to the web HMI. Now when we use this password, and then here you can see that we get access to that device. And if you see on you know, this HMI interface, uh, there is an inverter placed in that mimic diagram, and then you can get the complete idea that uh, you are in control of that, uh, this uh, solar panel, or maybe the solar devices through inverters and all that. But the, the problem again here is that it's just a web. Through web, these problems persist, and from there onwards, the attacker can exploit it very, very easily to gain control. I always believe that if I can do it, then I think any other person can easily do it. Because the reason is that as a security researcher, you think from that perspective, and attackers are like thinking from much more wider perspective because they have a lot of time, a significant resources to invest, and I think these vulnerabilities can be pawned pretty easily, and they can control all these devices. So I just, uh, we can take a look into it. Damn demo here. Just a one minute demo, just try to show that the vulnerability actually uh, exists here. So the vulnerability has been reported to ICSR, they are working with the vendor now. So see you get a Java applet like this, although you have to accept the risk in this case. We are accepting, try to load the Java applet in here. So 
let's say by default you're gonna try the admin password, but it's not gonna work, it did show you, you're not allowed. So we're gonna forward our simple tactic. We're gonna go into the source code and we'll go for the jar file to try to see what resides in there. And we file that they have this VM, vms.jar file. And we, uh, I already downloaded it earlier and now we're gonna look into the source code analysis, just a simple thing, five minute of stuff. And once you look at the classes, once you do a lot of source code analysis, you need to be, you know, you get an idea that where you have to look into. For example, authentication login classes, you know, session identifier classes and things like that. So you're just skimming over things. So first we're gonna look into any hard coded configuration and other things. So now, here you go. So when we look into this, the class has like uh, hard coded information. It's just uh, like a five to 10 minute of job in this case. And for advanced attacker, it might be a little lesser. But again, the thing is that your hard code credentials are being present in jar files, flash files, insecure authentication design frameworks. And we are using SCADA a lot these days. And we are finding vulnerability as protocol levels, you know, Modbus and all those kind of things. But we also need to look into the web HMI, it's, it's just broken. And we'll take a look a bit more into it. Now, if you see that I got access to the complete web HMI, I can look into, I can change configuration and I can screw the device if I want. But it's just for testing purposes. So again, you don't need to attack the infrastructure right away, you just need to access the device through web. And then you have the idea what's going on in and out of the system. And there you go, you got access. Now in the next set of devices, I'm just going into a wide variety of devices to show that the vulnerabilities that are, we are discussing in here are, is, are not actually present in one specific device, it's a wide range of devices. And I, in this time I ha cannot cover all the vulnerabilities, but still, whatever the best I can, I, I will take care of it. So in this Rockwell automation ethernet series, you know, there's a variety of, uh, they have devices here, i766, i769 family and thing. Simple thing I wanna highlight information through disclosure, basically through default files. Just open it, there's a lot of uh, information being present in it. By default design of, uh, you know, web applications and things, I mean, you need to get the credential first even to provide any kind of info. But in this case, that design principle is not followed. Again, you have a RFI, you have a, lo a local file inclusion and long live cross site scripting. Cross-site scripting is good to just find out, but again, it can be used in specific scenarios, but in case of SCADA, I don't consider this that kind of uh, pretty advanced vulnerability or basically hardcore one. So if you look at this particular screenshot, information disclosure is happening. We move forward, remote file inclusion. Again, we just told you that that uh, black hat web page in it. And it's all unauthenticated, so you, uh, you don't need to wait for the uh, person to first do the authentication and process the link. He just clicks the link, things will be done. And I see if I get a time later on and the network is working, uh, I prefer to show you that dumb demo that how you can download malware on the fly with this thing. So cross-site scripting as usual, it's unauthenticated, simply send a link, get whatever you want. Now, so we have gone through the Schneider electrical devices, uh, these Rockwell, Keiko, Prisma, now we're gonna target actually Prisma web. And this is kind of pretty interesting, is one of the most, uh, I think easy vulnerability you can say, or a funny vulnerability when you see. So Prisma web is a, one of the vendor that are based out of Europe I suppose, and they actually built uh, different devices like metal detectors. They build devices like uh, checkwares and stuff like that. And they also build devices act for uh, x-rays like inspection machines. So interesting thing with this device is that through the web HMI is the password disclosure in JavaScript file. I mean, who could have even imagined this? So you are, let's say you are at in some sort of airport or some other place metal detector, you found that there's a Prisma web uh, metal detector is there, somewhere you get an access to the IP, boom, I mean, you can do a lot of bad things out of it. It's all in JavaScript, the client side. And it, it was working and uh, all the vulnerability has been reported. Again, CSER, full of CSER, full of heck lot of vulnerabilities which I don't want to go in right now, but this one is interesting through simple JavaScript file. Take a look, uh, so we access this uh, Prisma web here. 
right? So you get served with this web panel, and from there on onwards, we try to look into the source code to just understand, you know, what kind of components are being used, what kind of files are being included, and with this web HMI. If you see now, we access two specific JS files. One is like login.pad.js, the other one is config.js. So the config.js is like how it has been configured in a simple manner. But if you look at the login.js, it says Prisma Web and Prisma. So this actually shows that they might be running, in this case, a default password could be possible, but it is, they are storing it in a JavaScript file. So if you are going to configure, or any SCAR administrator are going to configure a new password for it, it's still gonna be present in the JavaScript file because that's the how, that exactly how device works. And so we have the credentials, so I got access to uh, the Prisma web by just using that simple password. And from there onwards, you can see that is uh, some vertical device. You can set up the parameters, it can screw up the process if it is going in. But this is, this is one of the funniest vulnerability I've seen in this, uh, you know, SCAR HMI research, but it has a lot of impact. I mean, for this vulnerability, if you're going to manipulate metal detectors, I mean, it's just crazy, but it's in front of you. From there onwards, you also have a cross-site request forgery, means the concept of tokens is totally not followed with SCAR HMI. Simple through HTTP GET, and you'll change the password on the fly, and then you can get access to it. I'll see if, I, if internet is working, but I. <laughs> Looks like we are not lucky today. Anyhow, but I can show you the demo if you're interested. I mean, just outside somewhere, I can show you the real time how this can be. I mean, just uh, some live device somewhere. Moving forward, now we're gonna take a look into the ITC controller device. Uh, devices, primarily the dosing pumps. So if you look into these dosing pumps, these are basically used for pumping water and some sort of other purposes. Again, you can look into the snapshot and you can get an idea that what it actually looks like as uh, you know, the controller 3000 design for it. And you again have a web HMI for it. But they have like some problem uh, with that. Again, you can upload the firmware in this case. It's just a variant previously for where we are uploading the files. Now you can go up and upload the firmware through cross-site request forgery. And from there onwards, you can go ahead and uh, you know, play. I mean, the device will be screwed in this case, but this is also a problem. So there are a lot of other vulnerabilities also present in this ITC controller, which uh, I might not cover, but it's just an open platform. You can go ahead if you get some time uh, or motivated enough to hunt for vulnerabilities. I think th this is a very good platform and to work with the ICS cert to report them and patch those issues. And following that, this is just a one ITC controller dosing pump, the request, HTTP request and response mechanism. And from there onwards, you can see that how the request has been issued and has been accepted. So you can upload files, firmware, and things. So con by with this vulnerability, once you control the firmware, so you control the dosing pump. In addition to that, these are poorly configured. You can find a lot of devices with default passwords and all that. But this is just from the design perspective, how the security has been, you know, lined according to. Uh, to the research, basically the people who actually develop this kind of devices. Now, the, for there onwards, hunting continues, and here I'm gonna do a little discussion, and the idea, this is just the tip of the iceberg. If you go around and search, there's a like, heck lot of uh, you know, vendors out there that provide web HMI services, and, for, and if you keep on looking into them and you know, try to l perform research into different devices, you'll find a lot of vulnerabilities, it's just not a rocket science, it's just you need to look into the control point which you need to control. And from there onwards you can spy your own inputs, stuff, and then you see that device is working according to the way you want it to be. But there's a big playground out there, it's seriously broken, not enough vulnerabilities in web HMI have been reported back to the ICS cert or there, but more all like the protocol level, DLL hijacking level. But if you open this scan, there will be a lot and lot of vulnerabilities in there. And it, from the conclusion, 
I can only say with this research, and there are other vulnerabilities out there, the SCADA web, web HMI security is completely broken. Why it is so? Because you know, we always used to say old is good and old is gold, and you can see like SCADA technology is being used for a long period of time. But in this case, when it comes to security, it's not that golden. But the problem here is that it's still being used in most of the critical functions in the, on the internet or our day-to-day -day routine purposes, like I discussed earlier, metal detector, dosing pumps, and then there are a lot of other additional details that are out there, so easy to find vulnerabilities, so easy to attack them, so easy to control them. And you can see that how, big, how kind of big market like Crimeware as a service can be built out of it. You know, you can go ahead, find it, register an account, and start selling these devices in the underground community. But this is a real problem. And uh, for that, I think for researchers, any motivated people, they need to come up and hunt vulnerabilities, work with the teams, whatever the best we can. But this is the actual state this point of time. Moving forward is there's some of the relative research which I've done earlier and other people, uh, portals, good resources to look into to understand what kind of vulnerabilities have already been disclosed, what new are there. But I personally feel that the vulnerabilities like cross-site file uploading, firmware uploading, remote file inclusion, all have a substantial impact considering the state of security in WebHMI. And thanks, and I'm open to questions. Feel free to have any questions. And if you need some demos, I can show you back end.